Hi folks, I'm Patrick Bolger, Hornbill's Chief Evangelist, and I'm joined today by Steve Boardman, who's our Head of Pre-Sales, who'll be giving you a brief demonstration. And we want to explain why, especially now, ESM is so critical, and how you can go about making it work. ESM isn't a new thing. When I was clearing out my office last July, I found a brochure on Hornbill's Enterprise Support Platform that dated back to 2005. Now, a lot has changed since then, especially with the technology, but those changes pale to insignificance compared with the change we've seen over the last 20 months. So back in August, I delivered a studio live cast keynote called 400 Days Later, IT's Path Out of COVID. Now, if you want to see the full live cast, the replay link is here on the bottom left. And it took a deep dive into the IT market's reaction to COVID based on data that we collected over a period of around 18 months throughout the pandemic. So let me explain the data journey. So Hornbill uses a number of tightly integrated systems that capture market intent data. And these systems track 25 IT and IT service management terms in real time across 5 billion data points, which get refreshed every week. And over 18 months, this has grown to about 6.5 trillion data points. And it reveals the topics and terms that IT service management professionals were searching for and the shift in focus of IT groups as they plot their ongoing journey on the path out of COVID. So this is some of the data and I, I won't explain it all. The first thing I want to explain to you is the graph here on the bottom left. So towards the end of 2020, the volume of intent data takes a bit of a nosedive due to the Christmas holidays. Now that's normal. And what's also normal is that people get back to work in the new year. We see this little spike, but this is followed by a huge spike in March, just as the pandemic hit. And that spike continues throughout lockdown and starts to nosedive again in July as lockdowns are lifted and life appeared to, appear to be going back to normal. Then as we hit December and into the new year, another lockdown causes real uncertainty and there's another massive spike. And this is largely due to increased activity from teams who hadn't used that relatively stable period over the summer months to update their technology. And as we get into February and March of this year, the volume drops back down to pre-pandemic levels. Then back in June, as the government was grappling with delaying their so-called Freedom Day, we see another spike, which quickly falls away after all restrictions were removed on the 19th of July. Now, I won't cover the topics here, as I got more detail on that based on more recent data. So the data here takes us right up to the end of November. And in the bottom left chart, what's immediately obvious is that activity levels, they're on the increase again. However, what's even more interesting is the shift in focus on different topics. So around this time of year, we normally see topics like help desk, service desk, ITSM and ITOM trending because teams are putting their, their plans in place for the new year. However, this year, they're all in decline. So there's a big swing in focus. And now the topics that are trending are IT and business transformation, workflow and process automation. And the data we're collecting reflects what we're seeing in practice. So ESM is rapidly becoming the new de facto. And these days, around 80% of inquiries we receive for new service management tools have ESM at the top of their requirements list. And it's no longer a case of just spreading ITSM goodness outside the walls of IT. What we're witnessing now is a drive for full-on business transformation with a focus on improving the employee experience backed up by workflow and process automation to truly deliver that shift to digital. And as remote, remote working continues to feature, this shift to digital, ESM, workflow and process automation, that will radically reshape IT's transformation into 2022 and beyond. So the good news for our industry is that IT is now more critically important to our organization's success than it has ever been. So many of the initiatives that you put on hold last year, things like hiring staff, updating infrastructure, rolling out new products, they've all been kickstarted again but with significant changes. There's a radical shift in the distribution of IT spending with greater investment in things like security, supporting employees working from home, cloud-based infrastructure, and low-code platforms that make it easier to automate and integrate processes. However, for many IT groups, that comes at the expense of data centers, local IT infrastructure, and even IT staffing levels. So make no mistake, we're now entering a period of hyper-transformation and it's no longer about improving IT or even IT services. Our future depends on our ability to create highly visible business value. And if you want to do that, you really need to get out of your silo. 
So a couple of months ago, I was asked to be a guest on an Enterprise Digital podcast, which is hosted by Barclay Gray and Ian Edginson. Now, it's a long time since I've been at the cold face, so I thought it'd be better if I could get one of our customers to share their practical experiences about the ESM journey. And I couldn't think of anyone better qualified to comment on ESM than this man, Darren Rose. He's from Vinci Construction, and Darren climbed the ranks from working on the service desk to managing it, then spending seven years as service delivery manager, followed by three years as IT service director, before landing his current role as central services operations director. So in his last role as IT service director, Darren introduced the concept of ESM. And he said that the real point of change was when teams started to approach them to add new processes to the service portal. And it went so well that the board approved an ESM strategy with a small team of three, which includes two service design managers. Now these are business analyst type roles, so they find out where different departments need help and they train and develop as they go, transferring skills and allowing teams to take ownership of their own destiny. And the ESM has been deployed to 60% of all of their business units. And there's huge diversity in the requirements. So for example, their on-site facilities team, they now provide the option to order a drone survey through self-service. So it's all laid out simply in the service catalog and costed with options so people can order it easily. And on the podcast, Darren shared some fantastic nuggets about how to get started with ESM. And there's lots more within the recording, so I'd encourage you to listen to it. But I've pulled out the main points here. So the first thing, gentle introduction, small steps. Essentially what Darren is saying is get going, get running, prove the case, and then say, look what we've done. Don't go with your IT hat on, because teams are going to think we don't work like that. Don't go with a proposal. Just ask them what their problems are. And the challenges that that they're facing the same things as IT faced many years ago. They're all trying to support employees. They're all trying to improve the experience and keep staff productive. And their challenges are similar. Unable to prioritize, firefighting, no baseline for improvement. Then, in Darren's advice, just solve one thing, then keep building. And once you create that momentum, it creates demand because teams will come to you asking for help with their challenges. So don't call it ESM. That can be too grandiose and they can put people off. Just talk to teams about how they support their employees and how you can help. And the final point here, discussing business challenges break down silos. So once you start talking to other departments about their business challenges, different teams start to understand each other. They understand how process can flow from one end to the other, end-to-end process design and considering the customer all the way through. Walden Forest, this is another great example of an effective ESM strategy. So they started with IT and their head of IT, Simon Copsey, described the implementation as one of the most straightforward he's ever been involved with. And once the self-service portal was rolled out to their employees, HR came knocking, asking if the tool could solve some of their challenges. And IT helped them get a couple of HR processes stood up. Then the HR team themselves took over and configured the tool. And within six months, the results they got were incredibly impressive. So here are some of those results. Employee satisfaction up by 22%, dissatisfaction down by 29%. Number of forms required for recruitment, almost three quarters of a reduction and information duplication, almost halved. And the time taken to recruit, 36% reduction. So those really impressive results and the common speak for themselves. And this isn't just good for our customers, it's also good for us. So on the G2 review platform, Hornbill is now positioned by customer advocacy as the number one enterprise solution across three markets in Europe. ITSM, Service Desk and Customer Self-Service. We have the highest level of user adoption, the best relationship with customers, the best support, and the highest net promoter score of any vendor. So what I'll do now is I'll just hand you over to Steve, who will give you a a short demo. Steve. I'll just, yeah, great. Okay, so you can see my screen now. Thanks, Pat. Um, All I really want to do is spend a few minutes looking at how Hornbill can help you as an organization implement effective enterprise service management. And obviously Pat cited a few use cases for our customers um, that utilize Hornbill to allow their internal teams to offer their services through a single destination um, on here. So Pat's already spoken about some techniques for engaging with these teams. And of course, the value can then be realized when they do. Um, Some of the key components on Hornbill which make this possible include our services approach, our workflow, 
uh, designer and our employee portal. And we're going to briefly look at all three of those in the time that we've got available to us. So talking about the Hornbill services approach, Hornbill basically enables any and all internal teams to publish their services. Teams can work in silos with autonomy where it's needed, perhaps where sensitive data is involved. But crucially, they can also work collaboratively to support shared customers on the same platform. Of course, when we do that, we eliminate lags and delays between teams where potentially they're communicating via email or phone, but certainly outside of the platform and where their processes are not automated. We can re reduce and hopefully replace uh, paper forms like Pat mentioned, and we can also allow our customers to interact with all internal teams in a consistent and coherent manner. Thinking about the individual services themselves, if we have a look at this from an, an IT and HR context in the time that we've got here, we've got Graham effectively is one of our uh, IT uh, team members and he's responsible for instance and change and configuration management and, and all of those elements, but he's also responsible <clears throat> for the IT elements of our service offerings, so that's desktop support, mobiles, printers, home working, etc. If we drill down and have a look at one of these services, we'll understand why these services are so important uh, when it comes to Hornbill. So, of course, a service will need a purpose, it will need an owner. It will also have the concept of supporting teams. And this is a, a simple but effective security model to ensure only agents in teams who support the service can view, manage, assign, and search for, and even report on tickets that are raised against it. And again, that's important where we've got certain teams that might have sensitive content in their tickets. We can understand who uses that service so that when we are surfacing up knowledge in the form of FAQs or knowledge documents or news and information, it's being targeted at the right people. We can also allow these teams to define and work with global or service specific uh, SLAs that are relevant to them. And we empower each of the teams to manage their own forms to define and publish their offerings for the service catalog and for them to be able to utilize their own data capture forms and their own uh, workflows for fulfillment and automation and just as importantly manage their feedback because obviously we want you know that, that element of being crucial in part in, in terms of continuing service improvement and allowing each team to to do that and tailor that to their needs is important so let's contrast graham here with sue Sue works in, in our HR team, so not interested in incidents and problems generally, more interested in, if we look at her processes, things like her grievance process, ensuring that it complies with internal and external policies and governance, or when it comes to recruitment, making sure that that process is streamlined and that we've got a bird's eye view of everything that's happening. But just like Graham, Sue is responsible for services that are published, and she can do that uh, from the service portfolio, just seeing her services. And if we drill into like the My Benefits service, again, purpose, ownership, supporting teams, who, who takes advantage of it, what knowledge is available, allowing those teams to work with their service-specific service level agreements um, is all very crucial. But also, as I mentioned, it's great doing that you know, in isolation, if you like, but where we need our teams to collaborate, we can do that very simply. And taking Manage My Talent, for example, that might be where we have our joiners, movers, leavers uh, type activity, and we're going to need these teams to work collaboratively to fulfill against it. Crucially though, all of these services are underpinned by Hornbill's uh, workflow engine. So if we just come up and have a look at that for a second. Uh, on here, and we'll just dive into an example. We effectively provide you with a code-free drag and drop uh, design environment that all of the teams can orchestrate their processes. So they can optimize their value stream chains. And this could involve actions such as routing rules, timers, task approvals, sequential and parallel processing, multiple stages, comms, and of course, automation opportunities. Now on that, Hornbill does provide IT operations management features, which will allow your organization to look for those automation opportunities, but probably once you've uh, optimized your processes. We do provide pre-configured uh, libraries for both cloud services and behind the firewall solutions, um, as well as supporting customers' needs to, to build their own automations out. Each team will of course have its own uh, automation opportunities, which will allow it to free up resources, reduce time, increase value, and Hornbill can work with you to identify these. Simple examples might be from an IT context, looking at user and group management or password resets, but all of these can be driven nice and easily through our uh, libraries that I mentioned before. So if I just drill in here, we can have a look at some of these pre-canned integrations that we provide, and coming down to Microsoft uh, and Azure, we can see how the options are there to create users, delete users, 
reset passwords or add and move people in and out of groups. But we can still do you know, mobile device management, software deployments, stopping and starting VMs. All of those options are available to you. So finally, really, and looking at this from a customer perspective, if we come back to self-service here, it's really a single destination to consume all of those services that the teams offer, and of course, any of the supporting knowledge and information. Here we're looking at the employee portal, which has got, in this example, clear navigation to the various IT, HR, and other service functions. Self-service itself is configured using a drag-and-drop canvas environment, so everything that we're looking at here are widgets, and it's completely brandable as you see fit. Let's just quickly drill into the HR um, view here, and we can see policy and procedural documents that have been surfaced, feedback on um, previous experiences, access to useful links, knowledge, and where I might go to make uh, initial requests. And we're just going to step through a couple of really quick examples here. So if I didn't know where to go and I just wanted to get information, I could use the search bar just to have a look at things like, you know, you know, when can I retire? When can I sort of stop working on here? Nice and easy. If I wanted to ask HR questions, then we can do that through very simplistic data capture forms, which our teams can have automated response to or single click responses. If I wanted to enroll into benefits that I'm entitled to in my employment, then we can make those accessible via the portal. And on here, it might be something like um, directing your user off to videos that your external provider uses to get your, um, your employees up to speed. If they're happy with it and they understand the implementation easy for me to say. Implications of uh, signing up to this from a salary sacrifice perspective in terms of how that affects their earnings, how that might affect them when they're doing mortgage applications and such like, then we can remove those paper exercises by having the audit trail here and getting those terms and conditions signed. If they're happy and great and they want to proceed, brilliant. If not and they want to speak to someone, build this dynamic nature into your forms. But if they're happy to receive the information they need to proceed, you know, doing this 24-7 at the weekends or, or out of hours, they don't need to rely on the HR team being there to keep serving this information up. They can track the progress of their ticket in terms of what's going to happen next, and we can automate, in this case, via email, where they need to go to sign up with that provider, the code they're going to need, and then what the steps will be that will follow. And the last one, just to wrap up with here, if we're talking about combining automation with our teams collaborating, I'll just take the onboarding process, and that's a common one that we, we all tend to like to show. Uh, on here, but I'm just going to fill some forms in here. Uh, let's just put Ian's joining us in a given role on a particular date, uh, working at one of our uh, offices. So we'll just pick that. Uh, obviously going to need some equipment. We'll click on finish. <clears throat> so we'll briefly have a look as this one loads through here that, that how these teams, IT, HR facilities can, uh, can work collaboratively on that. But also in the background, <clears throat> through those integrations and automations, we can create those users in AD, whether it's in the cloud of Azure or on-prem, we can get, add them to roles, we can create them in Hornbill, we can uh, sync up with the email, whether that's Office 365 or Outlook Online, and all of those things can happen automatically for us in the background, and as they're being completed, we can see here the various checkpoints will be marked, uh, and we can see that's happening in real time, and we've got some credentials passed back to us from those integration calls. But just finally, picking this up from the teams that are working on it, because there will be some manual work to do here. <clears throat> we can see those automations have taken place, but we can also see some uh, parallel tasks that have been assigned to first line and to HR. And we can go ahead and also using your uh, workflow designer, you can uh, decide what's sequential, what's parallel, who goes to what users, depending on your flows. Uh, and things like HR, where well, they might have a multitude of things to do. We can either do that for a series of tasks, or you can utilize uh, things like checklists and make it mandatory these checklists are completed before you proceed on to the next step. If I just complete that one, what we'll also see there, that's ITHR, if you like, involvement that's taken place, but we might need our colleagues in facilities to be involved as well, and we could continue down the path of having um, more subtasks, but one of the other options you can do is actually create linked tickets for your facilities team to work with their own process as a sub-ticket which will then come back and update the parent ticket in terms of moving this process forward and as an audit trail. And the last piece before I pass you back to Pat is, if you're going to that effort and obviously getting access to management information, uh, either in our tool or, uh, or taking this out to external tools is possible, here we've just got some basic KPIs you may have agreed with the business, and we can see in these widgets here how each team is contributing to the performance against those KPIs. So I'll stop there and pass back to Pat. I think we've sort of butted up against our time. Just see if there's any questions. 
That's great. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much indeed for that. Um, yeah, that, 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 there's one that's come through literally just now from Adrian by the looks of things. I've got one as well. I wonder if we can squeeze them. We've got a couple of minutes. Um, well, it's about the slide pack. Will the slide pack be available? I think we'll have these recorded as well, Adrian, so they'll be accessible in, in a couple of different ways. Um, when we look at, we, we talked about hyper transformation, um, and, and so I, I don't know, Pat and, and, and Steve, have you seen in these organizations that are moving towards the CSM direction, have you, what's the mentality like in IT? Have they, I, I've sort of seen organizations consider themselves put that part of IT as more like service integrators rather than people who fix stuff. Do you think, is that what we're seeing, do you think? Are we seeing these organizations or, or IT consider themselves to be more like service integrators and getting the value out of service integration? And if that's the case, how long has it taken some of the sort of case studies you mentioned to sort of get there? Um, that's a good question, David. Uh, so the, the case I use with Vinci, but I've seen it with so many other customers as well, they're not going out to talk about technology. They're going to talk to, to, to different departments about the problems they're having supporting their employees and how they can improve their life. And that's literally the discussions that are happening. So I think there's a fundamental shift because what also happens, I think, once you as an IT organization provide that highly visible business value, then people come back asking for more. So, I mean, in Darren's case, he said he had to have two architects join him to basically just go out and talk to the business units about what they need to do. It's not an IT role. They don't go with the IT hats on, but what they're doing is basically ensuring that business value gets delivered in a highly, highly visible fashion. And I think that's creating all the funding problems and all the money problems that IT tends to have goes away when you start doing those things. And if you look at that sort of the, the, the life cycle, that's the wrong word really, Pat, but get, getting there, so in, in Vinci's case, getting to the point where that has become the norm, how long, how long did it take um, Vinci to sort of get, to travel along that journey and sort of get there right. where they are now? Okay, so, so the initial thing that started with IT, and I think it was about 12 months they had stood them up and uh, HR were the first ones to come knocking on their door. And HR since came back and said, wow, if we didn't have this throughout the pandemic, we just couldn't have managed. So I think they're now about three years into their, to, into their whole ESM journey. And basically about 60% of the organization, central services are now all provided via the, um, the service catalog. So it, it's not an easy thing because it's a cultural shift. It's not about the technology. All the technology can do it these days, but you're changing the way people work. And you have to introduce that to them slowly. You have to show that you're there to help, and it's not a technology solution. It's basically a change to the way people are working. But I think the difference now is COVID has created the appetite for this to happen and the need for this to happen. And I think teams are a lot more receptive to that than they used to be. Mm, yeah, I think I think you're absolutely right. I think we're seeing that in some of the stuff we've been looking at as well recently. Um, so I, I I find that very exciting, guys. I do. I think it's a that that sort of step change that you mentioned there. I think it's a very exciting time actually to be part of what IT is and and that progressive approach to what the future looks like. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, right? I think we've got a few questions that we'll come or, cover off now in the, in the Q&A uh, panel um, very, very soon. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for sharing that look. And as I mentioned, you'll be back with us um, a little bit later. And until then, thank you. And we'll speak very shortly. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much.